What Eduardo has done, and with, with the collaborators, is you know, to produce this, this fantastic set of data. And John has already explained uh, that it tells us so much about what is actually happening in terms of tax experience. And suddenly we have you know, the possibility of the statistical analysis, the statistical analysis that, that Eduardo and, and Martin have already done, as well as the fact that the, the database is available, so it's possible to to work with it and, and explore what other opportunities there are. So you know, this, this effort has uh, produced such, added such richness to our understanding of what is going on in the international tax regime. This is, this is absolutely fantastic. Uh, John has already given a, a wonderful summary of, of some of the, the key interesting points, and, and I don't know that I can add anything to it. I think the, the points that he's brought out are, are some of the, the most important and interesting ones that, that struck me. Um, but when I was looking at it, uh, one of the really interesting things about this book is that there's this tension between the discussion of the tax disputes, uh, all these variety of cases, uh, the, the variations between countries, the, the, the focus on courts and, and the role of the, the whole map process, in, in this, and the rising role of arbitration, which uh, Ruben was just talking about. But combined with that is the structure of treaties. So there's this, this, this sort of interesting tension in the book between the discussion of tax disputes and the discussion of tax treaties and their structure and, and the, the global taxonomy uh, is both a picture of treaties and a picture of, of, of the disputes. So it's a, no, it's a, we have a fan of, of disputes which demonstrate the structure of the treaties. But these, these treaties are between countries. They, they don't overtly involve taxpayers. So one question sort of struck me with this. Why is it that we even have international tax, dis tax treaty disputes? Why do we have a system where governments have put together this structure of, of treaties to resolve issues in international taxation? And we still have disputes. Why do we allow this? Isn't there something strange about this? So I thought, well, what does that tell us about tax disputes? Or what is a tax dispute in principle? Before we get to treaties. Well, in principle, it's about the correct amount of tax. So a dispute between the government and the taxpayer. What, what is the correct amount of tax? And of course, the whole point is that you know, we don't know exactly what the correct amount of tax is. So, so we want to argue about it. Well, if it was simply this, this nice good faith argument about what's the correct amount of tax, that would be relatively simple. Um, Jeremy Horder alluded at the beginning to dis discussions about different ways of interpreting legislation and treaties and literal and, and purposive approaches. But we all know, and one of the points that, that Eduardo is, is making in, in his discussion, that the motivations are all rather more complicated. and. Uh, part of the whole structure that we're talking about is concerns that the taxpayers are not really interested in the correct amount of tax, they're interested in avoiding tax. But equally, although it's lesser a, a topic in this book, but perhaps uh, referenced by the 100% the solution in favor of the government in China, we may also anticipate cases where governments are actually interested not in the correct tax, but in getting what they can in what we may call an arbitrary amount of tax. So the picture is actually rather more complicated because there are three possible motivations in a dispute. Determining the correct amount of tax, obtaining less tax, avoidance, or obtaining excessive tax, some arbitrary taxation. And the taxpayer may be interested in either of these two, and the government may be interested in either of these two. And in any particular dispute, we don't actually know which motivation each party is, is, is involved in. So suddenly, uh, the, the way in which we understand tax disputes becomes more complicated, and we need a more sophisticated analysis than, than just a, a, a legal framework. So we can imagine that there are different domains in which we can think of the tax dispute taking place, not just the legal. And there's obviously the economic, which might, we might think of as the basis for uh, issues about avoidance, 
but also political issues which we can think about as, as the motivation for, for the arbitrary disputes. Though, of course, a little thought will, will bring out the fact that it's not quite that simple. There are political motivations, what we might call political motivations in, in avoidance, not to mention legal ones, and, and governments also have economic interests, the whole interest in, in uh, attracting uh, investment is both political and economic. So thinking about this shows you know, the potential richness of how we can think about these disputes. What happens, so, and, and, and on top of that, if we come back to this idea about the tension between literal and purposive interpretation, and if one thinks about how uh, the big, great disputes about avoidance have developed in, in the UK and, and in other countries, we in fact find cycles in the way in which we, we analyze these courts as, as you find concerns about avoidance, dominating correct tax, so courts move up towards the role of the government, and then the government looks as though it's abusing the opportunities it gets, so courts move back towards the taxpayer, and that gives rise to more opportunities to avoidance, and so we get this, we can perceive a cyclical process, which may be one of the things which explains these, the different positions in different countries, as uh, the French courts may perceive uh, a greater motivation towards uh, towards arbitrary taxation on the part of the government and therefore favor taxpayers and in other countries uh, decisions in favor of uh, uh, sorry the, the French government yeah, defi decides in favor of the taxpayers because they see the government uh, having uh, undesirable motivations whereas in other countries the government wins because courts see uh, avoidance motivation so we can so this is an interesting way of thinking about it and how does this work in the international sphere? Well, the international sphere is suddenly a bit more complicated because we have two issues about the correct tax. The correct tax in country A and the correct tax in country B. So suddenly, uh, this analysis, if we try and draw lines between it, is going to become quite complicated. So how do we simplify that? Well, you know, there are all sorts of discussions which come out in, in, in the book, and particularly in in the discussion about, about the, the triple avoidance, about the motivations for having tax treaties. But in the context of disputes, I suggest one way of thinking about a tax treaty is that it's, it's trying to simplify this, this story. It's trying to say, well, the tax treaty is saying we envisage a system that encompasses what's going on between both countries, and therefore we can have dispute resolution that is about dispute resolution in the context of the treaty. And we therefore simplified it. Now, that's also saying, but this is also a treaty between the governments, so the governments are saying, this is our matter. We, we, we take control over, this, over this, this process. Except that they've created something separate, a separate instrument, the treaty, which can be adjudicated on by courts, for example, in, in the legal domain, and the courts then say, well, you've set up, you, the government may have set up this treaty, but it's got a legal life of its own, and therefore the taxpayers have an interest that we will, we will seek to, to support. And then we can say, well, the government response is, well, we can actually solve this problem ourselves. So the map process allows the government to take the treaty back into its domain and exactly what domain is this. I've put a label administrative there because it's not clear whether how that fits between legal, economic, and, 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 and political. We can think of it in, in, in different ways. So we can see this, this treaty as a way of, of trying to unify these different interests, which then creates new points of tension, uh, and new ways in which the government and the taxpayer can, can assert the nature of their, of their interest in it. And so that brings us to the point that, that both uh, Ruben and, and, and John have, have raised, which is the question of what happens when we have arbitration. And uh, we've seen these arguments. You know, is, uh, so John suggests that arbitration is going to roll up map and make this a, a much more uh, effective picture, whereas Ruben has, has suggested uh, with equal force uh, that the concern about arbitration being secret shifts it back in, in, in the other direction. So what I really see in this is that, that we have this, this network of material, and particularly we, we see exposed 
the results of the different motivations that both taxpayers and, and governments have. And we see something of the mechanism that is provided both by the structure of the treaties with this overarching, or with this, with behind it, the influence of, of the models providing uh, a base structure for countries to build on. But then we have this, this structure of dispute resolution on top of it, which provides ways of using this, this treaty structure to achieve a balance between taxpayers and, and governments. But if we start to think about it, the ways in which that tax and that balance operate are, are quite complex. And the modes of dispute resolution through the courts, through maps, through <coughs> arbitration, provide ways in which those different motivations can come to the fore in, in, in different ways. So what we have through this book is a wonderful resource in terms of data, in terms of statistics, that we can, that we can build on to try and understand what some of these motivations are. And uh, uh, as Eduardo has said, we can use this going on, on into the future to try and pick apart some of these, these complex structures and interactions which are going on. And hopefully, as we all look through this, this data in, in more detail and, and, and look through all the, the wonderful explanations and, and elaborations which the, the two volumes and, and all the contributors and, and Eduardo have provided us, we will find uh, increasing richness and hopefully increasing understanding of what's happening in the system uh, in the future. Thank you.